Today I've uh, titled today's message called Benched. Maybe you've uh, played some organized sports or you know someone who has. And then that phrase would be familiar to you. The term being benched. It's the idea of a player being forced to sit out of the game on the bench. Something went wrong. And now you're being forced to sit on the bench watching the game. If you've been benched before, then you know what it's like and what a horrible feeling it is. I have been benched. It, one time it was so bad that I was running off the football field and one of my coaches gave me the double finger thing. Well, and I'll let you read between the lines. I've been benched. How about you? Have you been benched? Seems like when you're benched, everyone is staring at you and you're dejected. You're full of embarrassment and shame. There's fear, there's confusion, and then anger and resentment. Have you ever felt like that in life? That you've been benched with no hope of getting back into the game of life or in relationships or in a career or with family or with a special relationship? Something went wrong, and now you are on the bench, and it feels like you're all alone. And there's no hope. What a horrible place to be. It's at times like this that confusion, frustration, fear, doubt, depression, it wants to invade your heart. You've been benched. And we begin to ask all sorts of questions. And many of those questions start with the word, why? Why? And you're not sure who you can turn to when you've been benched. You don't know who to talk to. Even the closest of the closest people in your life. Because you've been benched. And you don't know if anybody really would understand. If anybody would really even care to get it. So maybe you're here today and you feel like you've been benched and you don't know why. So let's take a look at what could be going on. If you got your hand out and you want to fill in some blanks. When you feel benched, it could be. Number one, God's sovereignty. See, in Isaiah 55, 8, it says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, Marvin. Oh, I'm sorry. How about you? Says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. What do you mean? Marvin, I'm sovereign. I know you don't understand what I'm thinking. I understand you don't have a clue about what I'm doing. But will you trust me? And then it says here, look at this one in, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. And this is the plan. Okay, wait, wait, wait. You want to know what's going on? Here's the plan. Paul tells us in Ephesians, he just goes, here's the plan. This is what's really going on. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Marvin. Well, th isn't that how we live? Hello? Isn't that how we live when God doesn't do it my way, in my time, and how I want to do it? Then something's wrong. Something's wrong with God. God's broken. He, I mean, he just doesn't get it. He must not have a, Lord, you can use my, use my Casio. I know yours is broken. Timex doesn't work anymore. Use this one. Don't we do that? 
At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, the one who rose from the dead all by himself. Everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. Now we're getting it. Now we're getting it. See, these verses speak to the fact that God is sovereign. That means God is in control. God is all-powerful. God understands the future. God understands Marvin when Marvin doesn't understand Marvin. God's got it all figured out. God's got the plan. Sometimes I get frustrated, maybe like you, because I don't agree with the plan. You know what happens when we do that? You've seen it. I don't like God's plan. Nope, taking too long. Nope, sacrificing too much. And we backslide. But God is sovereign. There's a story that's told in China many years ago. There lived an old man with his son and a horse. Back in those days, having a horse was like owning a $500,000 tractor today. So you can well imagine how valuable the animal must have been. Well, one morning when the man went to his field to feed the horse, the horse was gone. Well, people in the village said, what bad luck to lose a horse. But the old man said, good luck, bad luck. Who's to say the horse happens to be gone? Well, we'll leave it at that. The people thought the old man silly and wondered, how could losing a horse not be a bad thing? A couple days later, the horse returned and brought with it a beautiful mare. That's girl horse. People came by again. You were right. Not only was your horse not stolen, it brought you another horse. How lucky you are. But the old man said, good luck or bad luck. Who's to say, it's not always a good thing to have another horse. The fact is, now I have two horses, and we'll leave it at that. This time, his neighbors just shook their head. How could it not be a good thing to get another horse? Meanwhile, back at the ranch, the old man's son, while trying to break in the new horse, fell and broke his leg. When the neighbors heard of the incident, they said, you're right. Since the new horse caused your son to break his leg, maybe it wasn't exactly a good thing to get another horse. In fact, you might say it was unlucky that you got another horse. Same as before, the old man said, good luck or bad luck, who's to say? My son fell off and broke his leg, and we'll leave it at that. This time, the neighbors thought that maybe the old man was right, and they went back home. Well, a few days later, a war broke out and a government official came into town. He drafted all the able-bodied young men to go to war. And these men would end up going into a battle that most did not make it back. However, the old man's son was made exempt because of his broken leg until after he recovered from his injuries. I think James, in the letter of James, would have liked this story. He seemed to enjoy the ironic twist or two he began his letter with. In this challenging thought, he said, Consider it pure joy when you endure trials. See, God is not against you. He is for you. And He knows your future, even if it costs you a broken leg. So here's number two. When we feel benched, it could be number two, the enemy of your soul. The enemy of your soul. In John 10, 10, it says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Isn't that great? In Ephesians 6, It says, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. Did you know that he has strategies? 
just for you? Just for the body of Christ? Just for the church? Verse 12, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. What does that mean? It means what Ecclesiastes 3 says. There is a time for everything, and there will be a time of evil, of struggle. There will be a time when the enemy will come after you or your family. Anybody here never experienced that? Yeah, me either. Why? He's out to steal, kill, and destroy. He is full of hatred. By the way, he's not the equivalent to God. He was created by God to be an angel. He's now a fallen angel, archangel, with one-third of the angels of heaven. And when it comes time, they are going into the lake of fire forever and ever. Somehow we believe the lie that the devil and God are equal enemies. That's for the comic strips. But it's not so in the invisible world that has an impact on the visible world. Amen? Many times we are tempted to blame God for all the struggles in life. And we give the enemy of our soul a pass. No, don't be careful. Because I know that there are many in the body of Christ that they will blame. Oh, there's a demon in this thing right here. And I know that's what did it. And they're blaming the devil for everything. Now, just as weird and bizarre that is, it's weird and bizarre that we would never look that the enemy of our soul would try to do something wrong against us. There needs to be a balance of understanding that we are in a spiritual war. And we shouldn't blame everything on the devil. Why? Because sometimes we just do silly things and we get a silly result. Anybody make a bad decision on purpose and wonder why a bad thing happened to you? Don't blame the devil for that one. But there are things that you can be fully aware of. That the enemy is out for you. For your soul. And for your marriage. And for your kids. For your church, for your community, for this beautiful land we call America, for the world. Let's look at number three. When we feel benched, it could be our free will. It is just like the gangster whose bookie owed him $100,000. So the bookie... <laughs> The bookie was deaf, okay? So because he was deaf, um, the gangster here, what he went and did is he went and got his accountant who just happened to know how to do sign language, okay? You like my sign language? I don't know how to do sign language. And he says, come on, we got to go to my bookie. He owes me $100,000 because I won my bet. I won my $100,000. So he goes, and he op busts open the door, and he brings in. And, and, and there that, that bookie is just like, what's this all about? Doesn't know what to say or do. And the accountant, who knows how, he says, Guido wants his money. And he goes, I don't have any. He goes, he doesn't have any, Guido. He says, tell him I want my money. Where's my money? So he goes, He's getting serious. He wants his money. He goes, I, tell him I don't know where it is. Tell him I will shoot him if he doesn't tell me where my money is. This goes back and forth till finally Guido pulls out his big old gun, points it right at his head and says, I will blow your brains out if you don't tell me where my money is. Tell him where the money is. He will blow your brains out. He goes, okay, okay, okay. It's in the bottom 
left drawer of the desk down there. The accountant says, are you sure? He goes, oh, yes. Okay. Guido, he says you don't have the guts to pull the trigger. (laughs) Shall we say bang? You see, our free will can cause havoc and chaos on this blue marble we live on, not only for ourselves, but for others. That accountant had a free will, and he took full advantage of it. But it caused somebody to lose his life. What about you? How's your free will doing? Sometimes we can be benched Because of our own free will. Because we choose disobedience. Adam and Eve. There in Genesis chapter 3. They took the apple. And they ate it. You know there wasn't 613 Levitical laws. There there wasn't 10 commandments. There was only one in the garden. You see that tree? Stay away from it. Eat all the other trees, lots of trees. Just that one, stay away from it. That says, I'm sovereign and you submit. That's it. Just stay away from the one tree. And they ate from it. Then there's another guy by the name of Jonah. Chapters, what is that? Chapters 14, I think. Excuse me, chapters 1 through 4. And Jonah here, he's told by God to go to a place called Nineveh. Now these Ninevites were horrible people. They were so bad, they had done atrocities to the Hebrews. And he did not want to go to Nineveh and preach the goodwill and the gospel to these people because they would all submit, they would bow down, and they would follow God. And he went 180 degrees in the opposite direction in a boat. There God caused the tempest a storm. They did the lots to find out who who caused this storm. And it fell on Jonah. And Jonah says, it's me. I, I serve the one and true living God. They said, oh, why did you do this? He says, just throw me overboard. Notice he's not saying, go back to where we came from. He says, I'm still not going to Nineveh. Just throw me overboard. I'll die before I obey God. Throw him overboard. Some big fish swallows him up, spits him up three days later on shore. He's now an albino. No hair. Eyes probably weird color now. And completely albino. Now, can you imagine? The man of God, the prophet, shows up to Nineveh and says, God says he's coming with his wrath if you do not repent. And they all repent. Obedience. Where in your life are you disobeying God? Do you know? Then there's fear. This is the story in 2 Kings where Elisha's servant. So real quick, Elisha's getting messages from God. So he's telling uh, the military, the generals there. And they say, oh, okay. So the Syrian army's coming this way. We're going to go the other way. And they kept doing this maneuver. And they were ne- the enemy was never able to get Israel. He said, hey, what's going on? Well, they got this prophet. He keeps telling them what we're doing. He tells them the secrets even in your bedchambers. He says, okay, I'll send, a, I'll send a whole army to go get this one prophet. And as they're coming across the hillside, all of a sudden, as, as, as Elisha's maybe in his tent sleeping, there is the servant, you know, he's working on getting his chores done, and he looks and he sees this army coming. The Bible says that he's full of fear. And he runs and he, he literally rebukes Elijah, the prophet, says, what are you doing? We're, we're, we're going to die. I told you to stop, but no, you got to go, man. I got to go tell them what the God said to them. But no, no, we're going to die. He's full of fear. He's full of fear. Are there places in your life that you know God wants you to do something different and you won't because you're scared? And I get it. When you've been hurt, When you've been wounded, when you've been taken advantage of, you do not want to risk again. 
I get that. So all of a sudden, Elisha prayed that the eyes of his servant would be open. He'd be able to see into the spirit realm what God was doing that he could not see in the natural, in his flesh. And as he did, the eyes of the servant opened. And as he looked across, he saw nothing but angels sitting on chariots of fire. Yeah, come on now. Bad army comes in. They're blind. Elisha takes them in to the king of Israel. He says, what do I do? Do we attack? He says, no, nah, feed them and send them home. They never came back to attack Israel ever again. You know, another one is doubt. You know, we have a free will to doubt. You know that story in Matthew with Peter. And it's here. In Matthew chapter 14, that Jesus had just prayed over his cousin, John the baptizer, who is now dead. He was beheaded, and he, he did all, fed all these people, and, and he told the guys, take off, disciples, go to the other side, and I'll come later. And there was only one boat. So Jesus is now coming because, well, I'm God, and if I want to, I can walk on water and can make it concrete because I'm God. So he's walking. He's a few miles out. And the disciples say, oh, it's a ghost. Wait a minute. He hasn't even died yet. I think it's a ghost. And Jesus says, nothing. And Peter goes, hey, Jesus, if that's you, will you can I play? Can you call me out? He says, come on, Peter. And Peter steps out of the boat. It's like, wow, this is cool. He takes his other foot, and his eyes are on the Lord. And he continues to walk and walk. And he's walking on the water like his rabbi, like his Savior, his Messiah, like his God. And all of a sudden, he hears the wind. And he sees that the waves are growing up. He's no longer looking at Jesus. He's looking someplace else. And before you know it, he starts to sink. He cries out, Jesus! Because what we do when things go wrong, everybody knows Jesus, don't they? Yeah. They haven't been to church in 10 years, but man, I'm sinking. I know Jesus now. And Jesus comes and he grabs him and he picks him up. And he brings him back to the boat, throws him in. Don't think good of the other 11 disciples. Where were they when Peter was walking on the water? Yeah, exactly. No faith. Yet Jesus chastised him because too much is given, much is required. And he looked at that leader and he said to him, Peter, ye of little faith, why did you doubt me? Have you ever doubted? If your pastor's being honest, I have. I've been Peter. I've cried out to God, save me, because I was sinking. And I've heard him say, Marvin, why did you doubt me? You doubt. You know, and you have free will. Sometimes we have blind spots. We just can't see them. By, by definition, a blind spot is that thing that you cannot easily see, yet it's still there. Even with the side rear view mirror on our vehicle, we still can't see that one little place called the blind spot. That's where those little cars like to sneak in and hide when they're driving them big rigs, right? Samson had a blind spot and it was full of lust. He didn't see it. His parents saw it. Samson couldn't see it in Judges. Simon the sorcerer, he had a blind spot. His heart wasn't right. Let me read this text to us. 
Verse 14 out of chapter 8. It's not in your notes, but that's okay. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. 16. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given when the apostles laid their hands on people, he offered them money to buy this power. Let me have this power too, he exclaimed, so that when I lay my hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. Problem with your heart right now. Do you want something from God for selfish motives? Are you willing to go, I'll give you money, God, just give me this. Everything's for sale, God. Peter. I love Peter. But Peter replied, may your money be destroyed with you for thinking God's gift can be bought. You can have no part in this, for your heart is not right with God. Repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts. For I can see that you are full of bitter jealousy and are held captive by sin. Oh, then he got smart. Here comes Simon now. Pray to the Lord for me that these terrible things you've said won't happen to me. You're a little late, Simon. How are things in your heart? Have you asked that? Have you ever gotten alone? And just asked. How are things in my heart with you, God? Can I just be real? Can I be honest? Simon wanted to obtain something, something that was holy. He wanted the Holy Spirit, but he wanted it for all the wrong reasons, the wrong motives. Then there is Alexander and his contentious ways. It says in 2 Timothy, Alexander is this coppersmith. Boy, he was just horrible to, to Paul the Apostle. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm, Paul says, and the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself, as he's talking to Timothy, his protege, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. See, sometimes we struggle with offense. Sometimes we struggle with self-centeredness. Sometimes we're so demanding. Sometimes we're, we're not patient. Sometimes we refuse to be teachable. And it's in those times that God says, you've got a blind spot. And it's going to come on you that you're going to be on the bench. Not because of what Satan's done, not because of God's sovereignty, but because Marvin's free will, not teachable. How many know you're always teachable as long as you get yes from whenever time you talk to a leader? How is it when the boss... How is it when the spiritual leader, how is it when somebody in your life of authority says no? What happens then? What happens then? Are you teachable? Even if they're wrong, can you still submit to authority? Oh, that's the hard one, huh? Why? Because we're Americans. I thought we were Christians first. It's tough. It says in Hebrews 13, 17. It's not in your notes, but it says, uh, 
obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls, and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. It's the same with us when we're children to our parents. It's the same with us with even those who we work for, those in the church who are leaders. You see, when we make it hard, God's not happy with us. Why? Because we want it my way. It's me, myself, and I now. And yet God says, Marvin, blind spot? It's going to put you on the bench. Do you have a blind spot? Do you know what your blind spots are? The truth is, we all have blind spots, and if we do not seek the Lord daily, we will not be able to see those blind spots that need to be exposed, and then we can deal with them. This is one of the reasons it is so critical to do the Life Journal. If you didn't get one of these last week, I encourage you, make sure you go to the information booth and and get yourself a Life Journal. And the instructions there, and also you can go and, and watch the sermon on my teaching on Life Journal. To read the Bible daily and to journal is being in the presence of God. It's being in the Word of God that shows you what it is in your, that's in your blind spot. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip this, His people to do every good work. When I spend time in my Bible, not reading the Bible newspaper, but really wanting to know what are you wanting me to see, God? And when I pray, and then I listen, God will show me my blind spots. And then He'll help me to fix what's in the blind spot. There are certain things I can't fix, but he can. The scripture helps you with blind spots in your life. By being in his presence daily, we grow in our discipleship. We begin to voluntarily surrender our will and doing things our own way. By being in his presence daily, we grow more discerning, more wise to see the strategies of the enemy of our soul. We become more keen on putting on the full armor of God. By being in His presence daily, we make our free will, with all its blind spots, bow down to the Lordship of Jesus, our King and our Savior. And that's where we try, in that, that's where we find true, true fulfillment and peace. You know what? God's grace is sufficient. I want us to close with this little video and I want you to know there's hope no matter how many blind spots and how many things in our life that we know just aren't right let's watch this if only I could go back and change some things set things straight I wish I had a do-over. I've made choices. I've lost out. I've wished a thousand times I could go back and try again. It's hard not to imagine what might have been. If I had just stopped to think. If I had just done as I was told. If I hadn't thought I knew it all. Why didn't I just take a few deep breaths? It took one second to listen. Maybe my life would be better. Maybe there wouldn't be such a high price to pay. Things would be different now. I wouldn't have so many regrets. But is everything lost? Can I just get a do-over? 
Is there a way back to new beginnings? Because regret can mean a new beginning. When it's given to the one who produces a repentance. A repentance that delivers me from my grief. The one who takes my mistakes. And somehow redeems me through them. Who tells me I'm not the sum total of all my regrets? He tells me not to look back. Because there's nothing there to see. I am not my mistakes. He is faithful and just to forgive me. I just have to ask him. And then I can look straight forward. Forget what is behind me. And strain towards what is ahead. And walk away with all regrets erased by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Every day I'm given a clean slate. A clean slate? I get a clean slate.